we finished the first song of the show, which is Larger Than Life. We hit the big button, Larger Than Life, boom! And in my ears is silence. Hello and welcome to the Keyboard Chronicles, a podcast for keyboard players. I'm your host, David Holloway, and I'm thrilled to be here, as I'm sure are you, Mr. Paul Bindig. Always good to have you here. When I'm with you, David, and with our (laughs) guests and with our listeners and viewers, I'm in my happy place. That's right. Thank God we don't live, you know, that close to each other. Otherwise, we're just hugging each other all the time. Oh, our, our wives would get very suspicious, <laughs> David, if we were too close. <laughs> so, no, great to be here. And uh, we're particularly excited to talk to Mr. Dominic Falicaro. Um, now, Dominic is an amazing musician, as you'll hear throughout the interview, and uh, is currently the musical director for the hit Broadway musical and Juliet, and it's played around the world. And I know in Australia it's debuting at the end of the year in Perth and then Sydney early next year. Um, so we'll hear about Dominic's role, and he's literally only been off stage an hour or two when we talk to him, uh, but we also cover a whole range of other stuff, Paul, don't we? Yes, indeed. He's got a very uh, rich background, and he, as you'll you'll find, he really loves what he does. He's got a lot of passion for his mm. work, and so hearing him describe it, which I won't sort of steal the thunder, but hearing him describe it is it's it's kind of uplifting. What was for me anyway? It is. Yeah. No. Absolutely. So let's jump in and hear the inspiring Dominic Falicaro. Dominic, it's wonderful to have you here, and um, I'm particularly, I always say to our guests, we really appreciate you taking the time, but you have literally, in the last, I'm guessing, hour or so, um, stepped off stage, so uh, have you had a chance to have a breather? <laughs> Just a brief one, a, a hello to the missus, uh, a, a, a welcome uh, from the cat, and then right into, right, right into record, <laughs> but just very happy to be here. It's, yeah, so I it's, thought no, it, it's great to have you here, Dominic. And um, so we, we, I thought we'd talk about the reason you've just jumped off stage in the last couple of hours, um, and that's that you're a musical director um, for the amazing musical at Juliet. So for our listeners and viewers that aren't aware of it, can you tell us a little bit about and Juliet, and then obviously how you got involved with that production? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Anne Julia is a musical featuring the songs of Max Martin, who is, you know, the the greatest hit maker of the last however many generations. Um, and uh, it features a book by David West Reed, who is one of the head writers of Schitt's Creek. So it's a marriage of both, you know, uh, humor and heart and also just all all bangers, no skips for in, in a musical setting. So it's it's a really smorgasbord of amazing minds, but it's you know it's a musical with a a really like heartfelt and funny story, but that contains all the hits that we know from the last twenty some odd years, all all in sort of one place, a, an unbelievable body and catalog of work all in one place. And yeah, I've been lucky enough to music direct it and beyond. You know, I've I've worked on the show for I want to say six or yeah six or seven years almost now so from its wow. very like early inception up until now you know in its iterations in london and to the states and now it lives in australia and about to live uh, around the world and so let's dig into that a little bit dominic so you've been involved it sounds like from the earlier days and i know you provided some additional orchestrations tell us about your technical or musical role in the lead up to it actually um being on stage absolutely i think one of the th- the the things that was useful for me on this particular job was sort of being a Swiss army knife that could be someone that oscillates between uh, knowing, you know, being able to dive into the stems of the, the original, you know, music that usually lives inside of a computer. And then also someone that could be like, hey, what's the viola doing here? And just sort of like, you know, someone that could talk about like what snare sample this is or what old synthesizer this came from and you know like i i get the feeling that very few pits on broadway are talking about the where the cutoff is on a synthesizer um and to be able to both talk that and you know write four-part harmony for strings and like do that credibly as well so it's a little bit like a smorgasbord of a lot of things um but i uh, you know it's going going from things where playing piano in the rehearsal room and it's original 
uh, inception and ideas and you know as as the the clay is still really squishy and what if we put this song here and what if he puts on this song here so i'm like sitting at a keyboard with a acoustic guitar on my lap and like kind of alternating between all the things and trying all the things and um but then yeah also you know being uh, blessed with the treasure trove of all the multi tracks of all these things and diving in to be like, that's the keyboard sound. Let's do that one. Um, and just sort of all things all the time. And then, you know, leading the band, we have an amazing, amazing band. Um, and sort of just, yeah, it, it's, it's different hats at different times, but it's also the ability to wear them concurrently too. And that's like the sort of like beauty of Broadway is the, like the liveness of it it's very like you get it's one take you know it's like the the epitome of one take and uh yeah it's a it's a really wonderful project couldn't think of better songs to do it with and yeah it's sort of all things all swirling around together great and i know there are similarities in some respects to pit bands but let's talk about your band for this one so what what's the composition and i'm assuming you're running something robust like main stage to cope even with what you do but just tell us about the technical part of of running that band yeah absolutely so we're nine so it's like rock band and string quartet so there's two two keyboards guitar bass drums and then uh traditional string quartet cello viola two violins um and we have an amazing we amazing band in london amazing band in new york i mean we just have been blessed to have such fantastic musicians pass through um and yeah there's all sorts of depending on the like uh granular nerdiness that you you want to get to but like there's all sorts of technology that lives inside what the drums are and what in, what's the, what the keyboards are and the difference between what my job is as the keys one chair because i also i play and sort of conduct simultaneously and keys two also has you know different language and so i could be holding down a much more piano centric part as you know the original uh talk box from it's my life plays on keys two or what you know all sorts of things get divided between the chairs depending on what's going on but uh there there's a lot of uh things that swirl around the band but it's cool it's it's a the biggest blessing of having a band like this is that you know you've heard these songs a million times in every setting from you know whatever cover band to whatever wedding to the radio and everything in between and you know i think that last little five percent ten percent is the even even with the best band that last little five ten percent is like what's the exact sort of weird sound and plug-in that's on the bass here to make can't stop the feeling sound right like what's like what is that keyboard there and you're working with the guy that remembers all the presets remembers all the stuff and like we just go in and get the exact sort of thing so it, that that's the like kid in a candy store vibe of yeah. this gig that's the like just the the best part so let's get a little bit granular and nerdy. I, you open that door, Dominic. So um, <laughs> be careful. Yeah, so I mean, obviously, <laughs> cues cues are everything in in musicals. Um, so yeah, just tell us about how you manage all that diverse range of sample songs, sounds, um, and, and make all that work. Absolutely, it's um, you know, it, some of the stuff is about um, diving into a stem and either you know slicing things into samples to get it to be played on a certain chair some things are about like oh that was played on this sound so let's do our like plug-in version or whatever version of this sound and i mean on Brawl, we were also lucky enough like there is a, a real profit on keys too so like we can get analog flavors from the keys two chair as well and like dial stuff in um but my rig i mean both rigs keyboard wise are running main stage and that uh, in front of me is a Nord stage and a MIDI controller. And it, you know, we have, we, again, blessed to have wonderful keyboard programmers, uh, Fidge Adams and Randy Cohen, um, who, you know, at some points the Nord is playing the sounds that the Nord itself makes. At some points it is just talking to other stuff to m play other sorts of, like, I don't know, whatever weird pad is in showing the meaning of being lonely or whatever sort of like other things live there. And it just, you know, cycles between them. And so that's, you know, on one side of my rig is the sounds that live inside main stage. And on the other side of me is Ableton, which runs our like tracks rig and click rig. And both of those machines are built like so bulletproof and double redundant. If something's hiccuping somewhere, I hit a button, we go to backup, like just the the again the like liveness of broadway like you think about the systems so much and you know uh the sort of like 
magic trick of Broadway is that I think the audience, there is a different oxygen in the room because you know it's taking place live in front of you. Um, and to solve for that, like, yeah, you want to be able to account for one something going wrong every now and then and just uh, that you can you can perform a hiccup list show sonically, even if you've been throwing a couple of curveballs. Um, and so there's a, there's a lot of that sort of stuff baked in as well. Dominic, I'm, I'm really interested in from an artistic point of view. And you mentioned there that we, you know, we, we're looking for particular sounds or, or elements of these really famous songs that will make them recognisable to the audience so they can relate to them. But also you're interpreting these songs for the idiom that is musical theatre. So I'm really interested in, as, as a music director, artistically, what are the things you're considering when you're deciding how you're going to make those arrangements and interpretations come to life in that idiom? That was the most fun part of this job and also a little bit daunting at the start of it because you're given songs that are the most beloved songs of all time with someone that is very detail oriented and knows every fiber of everything and they clearly work. So why, why, why are you messing around with them? Uh, but it, we couldn't have been working with a better collaborator than Max, who is the most generous and nice person in the entire universe. And something that we learned early on, uh, Bill Sherman and I, who or orchestrated the show together is if we're going to go close, Let's go real close. Let's not like go almost. Let's get every every little thing right. You know, when yeah, when it's my life starts, it's not sort of kind of the talk box. It, it's exactly the talk box and uh, everything that sort of falls under that umbrella. But he was also the first to nudge us that like if you're gonna go far, let's go real far. And you know, let's go especially with some of these songs. Let's take them different than you know people have heard them before. And I, I think of a song in the show, Baby One More Time. Uh, something that we did right away is like it starts with the iconic like M1 piano, like just everyone knows it the second it comes out of the speakers. And what if we made this song like a songwriter, guitar led sort of thing? Like what if we eliminated that as a starting point? A big theme in the orchestrations of the show are of some of the iconic motifs. How can we take them from the instruments and settings that you know them and repurpose them into other sounds so that Bum, uh, bum, 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 like ends up living in the strings, it ends up living in the keys, it ends up living in other places. And there's all sorts of Easter eggs of like the original guts of stuff that are repurposed through other things. And I think the luxury of having a string section is to like give this very um, theatric uh, sort of credibility in all sorts of ways that we can like use those palettes to, to kind of tell those stories. And we take these songs that sometimes are like known as like dance anthems or like, uh, you know, whatever feel good anthems, whatever you want to think about it and like really like trust the lyric, lean on the lyric and like be super emotional with them. Um, and it was, it was so fun to sort of the whole show. We sort of walk that pendulum back and forth of like, Hey, we're super close and we're going to gut punch you with nostalgia here because this is exactly the way you know it. And then the other end of that spectrum being like, wait, are they actually going to do this? I don't, I, I, I'm not sure. And then, you know, the, the sort of like joke of it or whatever impact of it lands when we start, I want it that way. And it just sounds totally different or something sounds very different than, than you're used to. And we just kind of like go between those two worlds and sometimes put them on top of each other if we need to mash up songs. But it's, that was the most fun part of the job is to be able to be given the long leash to go far. And then when we wanted to go close, it's like, Hey Max, like what, what was this? keyboard that you used on this and he's like oh it's this one this is the best yeah yeah and and it must be great in the moment to have the audience have those uh i'm surprised and delighted moments when either like you, you you nail something so close or as you said you you take something that everyone knows and just do it in a really different way and they're probably ooing and ahhing when it's happening so that must be a fun thing for you to experience too while it's happening it's so it's so part of my duties as music director is once a week I step out into the house and I watch the show. I take notes. I am like, oh, this cut off here. We need to remember to put our S's together and all the, you know, all the <laughs> other like minutia that I mean, doing eight shows a week. I mean, it, like the amount of respect for the actors up there on stage, like it is peak athleticism. It is unreal what that ask is. It's not only like singing all these songs and being like in such an elite club that can do that. And it, then it's like, oh, just spin on your head for the next two and a half hours and do all this choreography. It's, it's, <laughs> it's pretty wild. Getting to listen to an audience and watch an audience experience the show is like the greatest joy in the world. And like to see it resonate with um, people that both know the music deeply and are delighted to hear it 
And I love when like older folks come that this music has no sentimental value for them. Like this is just a show that they're watching. And the goal is that it just works even in that context too. And I, I'd like to think that we, we, we achieve that as well. It's like amazing to watch uh, people find their own sort of love stories from within the show that we've made. And it's, it's just a great joy to watch people like, yeah, the either like instant reaction or the slow burn. And I'll, I'll take either one. It's, it's, it's a really, it's a, it's a, a uh, very like humbling and great pleasure to have that happen. Yeah, it sounds sounds completely amazing. So Dominic, can can we take you back and uh, we, we'd love to learn a bit about your formative years. Yeah. So as a young person, what 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 inspired you? How did you first start connecting with music? Playing piano was a very uh, happy accident that happened. Um, my grandparents dropped off a like giant like magnus chord organ to my parents house as opposed to like getting rid of it themselves i don't know and my parents put it in my room and you know i i don't remember this as vividly but the 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 fishing tail that has it has turned into is sort of that i had turned it on and figured out how to play you know show themes and batman or whatever on it and um my parents were like do you want to is this something that you want to do? And I was in uh, like, I don't know, five or six kindergarten ish age. Um, and I had a wonderful, uh, first piano teacher, um, who was so, so supportive and just very, um, yeah, just could not be better to learn the instrument from. And then, yeah, was trained classically for, for a number of years. Um, and, uh, my first teacher moved. I ended up with a teacher that I wasn't connecting with as much. And my sort of like passion for doing it started to wane a little bit, especially as I was getting into like peak blunder years, high school stuff. And um, I, I just realized that there was a big gap between the music that I liked listening to and what I was playing. It's like I've been playing for 10 years. Like theoretically, I should be able to play what I like. And there was just this big disconnect between it i wanted to play elton john i wanted to play ben folds i like wanted to do these things that i was listening or just listen to the radio and play it back and that that was just a big gap um and i was very i i had uh also at the same time was suffering from tendonitis and like i, I was just over it i was like 15 16 just very over it and my parents were again the biggest supporters in the universe and they quietly or not so quietly were trying to find another teacher like please just like what let him play whatever he wants just like please don't like don't let him quit this easily um and i met uh beth Leroy, my like amazing piano teacher in high school and she, I, all i wanted to do was pop music then and i i obviously love pop music i spent the last seven years with with max and pop music is yeah the the, the top of the mountain for me but um yeah i i remember like wanting to learn um a, like a billy joel or ellen john something and um, I, I was practicing from a transcription and she had always been trying to get me into jazz and I just really, I wasn't about it that much. Um, but she played a passage and she played something that wasn't on the page, but it sounded better. And I was like, what's happened? That was something. What did you, what did you do? And that was like her full, like hook line and sinker moment of like, I, oh, I gotcha. And from then it was just over because all I wanted to do was like learn this language very deeply. And then it was just like full jazz nerd, just like Herbie Hancock, Keith Jarrett, Chick Corea, like just the greats and just really like as deep as possible into that universe while also simultaneously being like, I will play in whatever garage band will take me. I will lug my huge curse wheel into any basement and I will play any sound you that you want. Um, and just loving the, the notion of jamming. And so that was such a big part of like trying to get jazz chops together in high school while also like just loving the, the experience of being in a band so much, just like the collaboration and all, all that it entailed. Um, and at the same, it was about that time that I also really enjoy, enjoyed stealing my parents' computer and figuring out how I could plug my keyboard into it. That was the, that was the next thing is like, how do I plug more than one thing in? Like what, I, how, how do I do this? And like figuring out in like very early cakewalk versions, how to, how to record stuff. Um, and that sort of like, you know, uh, that got put on the back burner as I studied jazz in college. I did a much more conservative jazz program, uh, conservatory jazz program. I finished that, and I think ultimately jazz was this thing for me that uh, was like the language equivalent of speaking Latin. If you can really speak this 
this language, you can permeate into other languages. And you find out, like, through flipping through records, it's like, why is this guy on, why is Anthony Jackson on both this jazz record and the, you know, whatever, the OJs or what, whatever it may be? It's like, how can you, how do you do that? It's like, I want to be that guy, like, that can just show up in any universe. Herbie Hancock's doing his thing and playing with Joni Mitchell. Like, that that was the most interesting thing in the universe. Um, and so it was that combined with a couple of projects going into the recording studio. And I was like, oh, this is home. I want to be here very much. Um, and then it was a pro process of like, I should probably figure out what all the buttons do. And so that was the next project of like, sort of, I, I would de facto end up as like MD of whatever college band or whatever sort of pickup gig I would end up being on just by virtue of sort of being the personality that would speak up in a rehearsal of like, perhaps the kick drum pattern and the bass pattern should coalesce and have something to do with each other. And then you sort of realize that that person and that voice is also doubly needed in the studio. And I just became infatuated with that. And it sort of like led to this tangent of recording studio stuff. And that recording studio tangent kind of led to refinding Max and other stuff. It's been sort of like a the beauty of saying yes to life a little bit. And the the current has taken me to some very interesting places. But that's a long and circuitous answer to your question. Right. But it's it's a lot right of this. Up. Yeah. <laughs> No, that's great. That's great, Dominic. And I, um, so what was your first, I mean, you mentioned studio. So outside of college, what was your first gig where you thought, okay, I'm actually doing this for a living now? Yeah. Um, I mean, honestly, the, just the first time getting paid money as like a side man was like, whoa, I can't believe it's like, I, I would have just showed up like this is great. I think also, again, like out of a deep say yes attitude, um, I was a freshman. I had just arrived to New York. It was like week two of being in school. And New York just seems like an impossibly big place to like think about conquering, much less like make a li living. I was in a class with someone that was a senior that had very regular gigs. Uh, and we were in a class and he was like, do you also play organ? Um, and I'm a very quick to fake it till you make it kind of person. I was like, yeah. And, you know, I, I had played organ sounds on stuff and I'm familiar with the vocabulary, but like jazz organ of like the perpetual walking bass and like the other stuff that's expected in that vocabulary is definitely, that's a higher altitude, you know, like obviously no shade to the, uh, like other kind of rock presentations of organ, which I love deeply, but like it's, it's driving a, a, a boat when you play those, those kind of things that you're able to walk and stuff like that. Um, but I was like, oh yeah, absolutely. And so to like play a club date, like very early in college, that was also another like, okay, all right, we're doing this. Like yes to everything. Let's just see where this goes. And so that was another sort of full, like, I think I could do this. Like if I can do this, other, other things must be easier than this. Um, and I mean, there's so many experiences that are sort of born out of that thing. I ended up, um, I mean, a couple years later, I, got a very like early morning text from uh the great Rachel Z I don't know if that you know who played with Peter Gabriel for for a long time uh who was a professor at the new school and she texted me saying Kevin Mahog needs a pianist right now uh who Kevin uh was a great jazz vocalist um and it was just one of those things where like I had to like quick hop on a bus in like 45 minutes and like get to wherever they were um wow. and like no rehearsals no nothing like no charts just he's going to say songs and you're going to play them like oh, wow. and, and just the the notion you know i know that there's definite different versions of like music in higher ed like you know fluctuation in its in its value and especially as it gets more astronomical but to me it was also like this this is what i'm paying for like this theoretically is what i should be able to do right now someone should be able to say i want to play this song in f or whatever and i'm we're just going um and it went great and we play a few gigs together um but yeah just i i think there's like a lot of little like milestones that are all sort of in the like what saying yes can bring you and where it can lead you. I mean, something along that lines is one of my first jobs after school um, was, you know, all of a sudden you finish the like safety net of school and it's like, oh, sh shoot, I live in, in New York City now. This is a very expensive place to be. Like, uh, how many gigs a month exactly is is this? And so one of my first jobs ended up being um, playing piano in Mommy and Me classes, like children's classes. And uh, it was in my very first one where I met my now longtime friend and collaborator, Tim Kubart. Um, and he 
uh, we, we played, you know, a class of Twist and Shout and whatever, like, you know, wheels on the bus needed to get played that day. And he was like, hey, I'm re recording in the studio this weekend. Do you want to play keyboards on my album? And it's like, absolutely, I do want to do that. <laughs> and showed up to their session, and it was me playing my parts, and I tracked my parts. So I'm a little bit of keys, a little bit of synth, a little bit of this, and a little bit of that. And then the next thing that they did was... Um, tracking background vocals but uh tim was also my ride so i was gonna hang out no, no matter what and it was just sort of sitting around and they were going for a part kind of over and over again and it was just one of those things where it's like i think i think they should be thinking of the other note here i think they i think they're wanting this and it's like do i speak up do i speak up and finally it's like yeah i'll speak up it's like do you want to try this thing and it worked and it was great and that was the like again uh really deep investing in the studio of like, oh my God, I want to be here. I want to be like shaping the music. I want to be, in, I was like, can I, I, can I come to every session? He was like, sure, yeah. great. Yeah. And then you fast forward that three records in a few years and we won a Grammy, which is just, right. you know, beyond, beyond the pale, beyond any ex wildest expectations. And you just never know. Like I didn't expect necessarily to be in children's music, but Tim and I have an amazing collaborative relationship. I never expected to be, in musical theater, but the chance to work with Max was the most no-brainerest of no-brainers that you could yeah. have, and you just never know where it's going to take you. So I think it, like the the whole like, could I get paid for it? Could it be a life? Is just this like happy consequence that can come from just pursuing it as like a sole single-minded focus. Yeah, no, agreed. And I think I think your comment on saying yes and being willing to take on diverse roles is, is a, absolutely the secret. And so you mentioned Tim Kubar, and um, we, we definitely were going to ask about that. And obviously, the Home album was the one that won the Grammy. And I, I took the opportunity to listen to this music. Well, thank so for you. our listeners and viewers, this is not standard. Well, what would be called stereotypical kids songs? There, there's some. Brilliant, and the, and the diversity. I can see why Dominic, you're involved in something like and Juliet because the diversity of the actual music across each album is huge. You go to everything from pop and rock to um, like ballads and and stuff like that, but all with great kid focused themes. I mean, how? What was the writing process like? Uh, like for you, witnessing that as on the production side, sort of. What was the process in creating that? Well, thank you for doing the listening. That's so kind. I, those records mean a lot to me. And it, it's such a, again, like really wanting to be the like peak of credibility in that space of that music to me. I always wanted it to be like sort of the Pixar of what a record could be in the sense of like, this can work at this level and you can experience it as a kid and absorb it in that lens. But that there's this also this tier that's operating at this sort of altitude where you can let it hit you and it can be about being a kid and those two things always rolling in tandem and trying to just like serve that musically and so tim i mean to to be someone that wanted to pursue uh making music for children and like speaking directly to children not as like an afterthought not as a hustle to get somewhere else but as like a deep meaningful uh pursuit and purpose i i was drawn to that right right away um, and then he has a collaboration. Our, our, our sort of collaborative circle includes um, uh, Matt Puckett, who they sort of shape the songs together and then give me sort of the like, hey, it's in like it's 60, 80 percent done ish vibe. And then we kind of keep tweaking it to the finish line. And we've worked in sort of different permeations of like starting from zero or starting from other things. I mean, we've done all sorts of things you know whether it's his records or what we wrote a song for the thanksgiving day parade a number of years ago it's just all sorts of, we've, we've written for sesame street uh, it's an amazing collaborative relationship and it, it it just so happens to be taking place in the like the children's space because that's where his like passion and knowledge is but it it starts sometimes as like a, a concept and a reminiscing sometimes they come in with like a this song is about a lemonade stand or like i, I want to do a song that's it's it's about asking for help but it's under the veiled guise of a lemonade stand i want to write a song about like yeah you know just the different i want to write a song about community but we're going to present it as like a 70 dis disco anthem that we call block party like it, it's just all sorts of things live under that umbrella and i love the fact that you know it brings us, yeah, deep into the studio. I'm picking out samples. I'm doing that whole thing that sort of like lives inside of a box. But I've also recorded a big string section. We recorded, we went to his elementary school and recorded his like third grade choir there for things like it's just, it's such a huge wide umbrella. 
and it, it almost feels like pop music in that space where it's like if you can serve the song if the song can stand in its most bare bones campfire version you can almost buy a lot of different versions of arrangements or other things with it and i i always wanted it to be that sonically and it's it's an amazing relationship that has led to such wild things us us making home led to a Grammy that led to us writing Sesame Street that led to me meeting Bill Sherman, who brought me on to Julia. It's just this very like kind of windy line, but it's it's the best of collaborators that you could ever ask for. And I do recommend those albums to parents because um, our, our kids are too old, Dominic, to have benefited. But I just love even the little interludes, for example, in Home of Jobs <laughs> at the House, part one, two, three. Yeah. You know, fo- could I fold the clothes and do this? Yeah. I just loved it. I just thought yeah. it was great. Anyway, over to you, Paul. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Not at all. It is wonderful music, but we, we can't let this Sesame Street thing just go by. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, Sesame Street is, and I'm not telling anyone who's listening to this anything that I know, it is one of the hugest TV shows in the world. And how does how does one how does one get to the point where you can write songs for Sesame Street? Are you are you, are you pitching to them? If so, what's that process look like? How, how does how does this come about, Dominic? Yeah. It's, I mean, it's wild to get a script and it says Elmo. Like, it's that's, that's the biggest star you could cast. That's it doesn't get bigger. Um, <laughs> um, we were brought in, we, we had, um, we won the Grammy in 2016, and I think uh bill and his due diligence like looks for writers every new every season, look, you know, trying to find new upcoming writers, and so. Uh, he brought us on and we were lucky enough, the first song that we wrote was f- when they introduced a Muppet, uh, a character that has autism. And we wrote her sort of uh, introductory sort of thing to the universe. Um, and so proud of that song. We can all be friends. It, and it, to the, the like stakes and gravity of it could not be higher. And, you know, you just sort of try to treat it like any other song of like, you know, they they have such deep um, curriculum and learning side things. So they have the words and they have the things that need to be said, but then you can kind of shape it into the song like form that it might work best as. And you just hope when you send it there, your demo back to me, I'm the kind of person where it's like demo is like too loose a word. I want to give you like, I want to give you 98, 99%. All you got to do is like swap in literally Elmo. We got sent a video back of them tracking to like, our session like doing the video cut to our session i was like all right we're 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 good um and it's amazing like to i i i got sent a video of that song like dubbed into a different language and it's just it's monstrous the impact i mean there's certain gigs you know there's gigs that i'm deeply proud of and there's very like niche interesting things that i feel very wonderful about doing but then there's like the tier that i call like uncle gigs of like hey i could say this to just about anyone that doesn't know what's going on and they know what's going on they they understand what this is and sesame street is like the epitome of uncle gigs to be like oh yeah i have a song on sesame street or like yeah and i've got i've been fortunate enough to do a number of stuff there and a number of like celebrity guests charlie puth and i'm trying to think of other other people it's wild it's absolutely bonkers but it's so cool to know there's so much that you do of like throwing something into the void and hoping it works and sesame street is the like sort of antithesis of that of like this if this goes like this this has such impact right away it's it's very the the one-to-one rewarding is a quicker process than you usually get to have and it's it's so cool and obviously, I understand, Dominic, you can't go into huge detail, but how does it work with Sesame Street? You compose that music. Do you broadly retain ownership or you're basically paid to provide the music and it's it's the Sesame Street teams after that? So, I mean, I think there is there is some sort of split that happens. The exact details are a, a little fuzzy okay. at this point. But I think the it's a lot like a record label in a sense that I think we retain certain songwriting things, but they own masters and things like that. Yeah, that the the exact details are a little little hazier, but um, it's still a, a really yeah awesome and very worthwhile oh, process. Absolutely. Also, to go in and watch something be taped, um, Bill, who uh, you know supervises that show and brought us in describes the environment and he's bang on accurate about it as like there's only two things where when you watch people walk into them the oxygen in the room changes and it's like it's meaning the president and it's elmo like when you walk (laughs) into that room it's just like this like this this like i don't know rush that happens where it's like oh my god that's 
that's Oscar's trash can. Like, there's just some, like, very, like, th- that moment in Ratatouille where the chef takes the bite and gets teleported back to being a kid. It's, it's that it, it, in its oh, most right. fullest uh, essence. But so, so amazing. You watch it come out of the, those puppets' mouths, and it couldn't be better. Couldn't be cooler. <laughs> You know, and, and what's amazing about that, is that that what you just described, it's, it's relatable to people of any age too. Like even even old blokes like David and I. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> you know, we grew up on Sesame Street, so it's a, it's, it's an amazing thing, no no doubt. We 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 opened up talking about Anne Juliet, but your your pedigree in the world of musicals is is far more than that. And I'd, I'd like to just touch on In the Heights and yeah. your involvement there, if we can. Of course, yeah. I was lucky enough to be brought in a little bit in In the Heights. One of the first things that I did with that production was definitely more um, like MD conductor related. Alex Lacamoire, the uh, ab- amazing Alex Lacamoire, brought me in um, when they were recording uh, the group vocals for that. You call in like all the like ringerest of ringer singers to, to, to sing on that. You're working with just monster, monster, monsters. It is the kind of thing where it's a very... High pressure might be too strong a word, but you you have a lot of stuff to accomplish. When you're tracking stuff for film, especially a musical for film, there's just dozens and dozens of cues and like little things that just... And it's both the musical integrity, but also this like kind of clerical, like, did we get it? Did we get it? Did we get it thing? And so I was brought in so that, you know, Adam, uh, uh, that Alex could stay at the console and sort of like be the musical ear, but I would conduct these sessions and like... Uh, you know, try to musically judge them and like maintain performance and yeah, just really like put an energy into it and a detail into it so that it could be relayed back. So I did a couple of those sessions and then was fortunate enough to be asked to write a couple of underscore cues or like orchestrate a couple underscore cues, uh, which was really cool to like see stuff that ended up in there. And that led to doing a little bit more work on Tick, Tick, Boom, which went to Netflix after. And both of these projects sort of lived in a funny uh weird squishy timeline of covid as well like in the heights stuff got a little bit butted up against it and then tick tick boom was something that i had submitted a like a demo initial idea for a song of it and then we ended up recording the cast album with it on it to like a, i don't know a year year and change later than that but it's a it was a very cool process to both be doing something that was still very much a musical but also very fully fully cinematic as well and just really trying to get like the fullness of a sound yeah amazing amazing movie and and you you've mentioned tick tick boom there which obviously covers off the life of jonathan larson um (laughs) i'm interested just as a musician before we get into the movie what does jonathan larson mean to you would you have had the opportunities like so many other mds and musicians had he not transformed sort of the face of musicals um back in that was it late 80s uh, late 80s i guess I, I would say it's maybe starting to cross into the early 90s yeah. just a little bit um but i mean you know to me it predates sort of my like it being on my radar just a little bit but it is you you can't escape being in the rooms where every other every person in the room is like i saw rent and then I went this way. Like, I saw this, and I thought my life was this way, and it went that way. And, like, Lynn and Alex speak speak that in that high esteem, and, like, you know very quickly the musical impact. And I think it was cool to me to approach it sort of fresh, honestly, you know. It just wasn't, it wasn't what I was consuming at that impressionable age. So to come and be, like, bestow this body of work and all the, like, kind of B-sides, because, you know, what Lynn did with the film is so, so beautiful of that. It is Tick, Tick, Boom, but it also, you know, they have access to sort of the vault, as it were. So that he's putting on sort of the show in a show, and we have had those demos, like, to listen to, like, early four-track, like, stuff of this was so cool. And to just sort of see a mind at work that detailed, because it's also, you know, Tick, Tick, Boom began as something that he did as a one-man show that got turned into a three-person show and then turned into a big movie. And sort of to, like, kind of track the iterations and the, like, expansions of it, it was just cool to almost be both a, uh, like, collaborator, but also just kind of fan of it happening. And it was very cool. It was I was lucky enough to produce and orchestrate a song on it. I think what was very like fortuitous and great, I had done a demo that uh, sort of like survived for a long time and yeah, then got to like flush it out into the final orchestration and stuff. And so I'm very proud to come to your senses on that record. Then I also played all of like, 
he's two for the movie essentially so like in the anything that's not uh alex playing piano like any of the pads any of the other stuff and so it was cool to like wear a few different hats for something at that scale and just sort of see all sides of it. It was a really cool project. It's also, again, like the benefit of film because you have to move really quickly through a lot of different things. You're playing in just ringer bands. It's just it's it's just a delight to be in it. And I think also at the time we were still pretty, uh, you know, living in COVID worlds and precautions and um, to feel very lucky to be like, hey, we we all committed to this and did the steps that it takes and all the logistical hurdles that it takes to do this and to feel so lucky to make music at the same time. There was so much. Um, and I mean, I love digital zooming and whatever. I'm here with you guys now. It's amazing. It's a it's a huge benefit. It's a huge gift. But also like the sort of like pain and like longing for the connection back and to be able to be lucky enough to get back into the studio like it was very meaningful to be like oh my god we are mm. making music together like we like heard a count off and then we played together like it was so grateful very a uh, very uh, for for a lot of reasons so you're working with this catalog you're working with amazing people and you're also just getting to do the thing where it's like oh my god i didn't know if we were gonna get to do this again and and to, just to be back in it was so wonderful Dominic, we, we have a question we ask all our guests, and, and, and no pressure, but I feel like you might be able to regale us with a, with a pretty interesting story here with all your high-stakes live work that you've done. <laughs> and that is, have you ever been involved in a technical or musical train wreck? And if so, what happened? I'm sure I've been involved in countless dozens. Um, I feel like part of, you know, and I guess there's it's a sliding scale too, because I feel like the, the first thing that comes to mind is just sort of being a working musician in New York and my like very formative New York years again in like the say yes vein was like I will play any gig at any club all the time like please let me play in your band you know not every place has the best back line not every place has you know <laughs> and so being learning the skill set of like I can't hear myself well here I can't like you know I'm competing up against Marshall Stacks and competing up against a lot of other things like just feeling the ability to take that energy and go from frantic into like all right it's it's whatever you know we're here i'm gonna play my part we're grooving this is great um so things in that vein come to mind really quick of playing in some real dives some real like and i've i've had play, had my share of playing to the bartender like you know i i've been there and i and i've done that so things under the umbrella of like well that like my keyboard didn't work and this thing didn't work um i think about um for uh i i want to say like a year or two years i played um at a church that um had a uh, for, for for lack of better a piano that wasn't in great condition and the, the the thing that was kept on the music stand of the piano was super glue because the black keys would fall off and part of the job was to play and glue them back on um <laughs> So that That's I amazing. think of, I think of, I, I think of that. Um, I mean, there's just so many things, you know, the, the, like, I guess more recent sort of things would be things in the Broadway universe of like, you know, you run on click, you're like very much on the rails for certain things. But if something interrupts that, um, whether it's a technical issue upstairs, whether it's an, an actor being a little early, a little late with something. And, you know, I think again, like any other sort of problem solving, it's like, oh, this, like we are like some, I, you know, something has happened. Someone has spoken early or someone has forgotten a line and we're about to miss this bar. And so, you know, early on, that's the kind of like nightmare of nightmares of like not feeling comfortable getting us back on the rails and stuff like that. I think of a few shows like that, but eventually just like any sort of practicing, that is a skill that you can practice. And so, those things come and go, and I, I those things most of them fall into a area where I would say the audience doesn't even notice those things happening sometimes because it's both through my practice and sort of you build systems of like okay if this goes wrong here I can kill the click here and I have safety points to get it back here and like you just really think of these things Broadway it also lets you just like a sport it's like hey like we reviewed the tape and it went wrong here like we should we should go back and correct it like. I have solves for a lot of the things of like, ooh, if someone went late for this vamp, I could get us back. And so like a hundred percent things go wrong or, you know, something something happens, but those things are just like, you know, keep it 
airline pilot cool, cool and collected. We'll, we'll get back there. Just a little bump. Like, we're, we're fine. Um, and I think it's also relaying that to a band of people who might be, you know, some, it might be their first time subbing in the band as something like that happens and just being very stoic through those things. But those are like, those things take woodshedding and practice just like the scales do. It's a different skill set. And like kind of growing into that has been a big part of this process. And, and you've answered a long held question for me, Dominic. Um, I've done a few amateur orchestra pit jobs. Um, and so I always wondered when you are sort of bound by a click. So if you've literally um, had the singers go off the rails, you just kill the click, catch up and then reintegrate as best you can. Yeah, and I think different shows have different ways of doing that, again, depending on how insanely granular you want to get. But there are definitely ways of like, you know, I'll stop it here and I have a point at the next chorus or I have a thing at this next thing. It's all good. Um, And yeah, it's just sort of what what are really proud moments is if, you know, our band gets to be very seasoned and very, very familiar with each other. We had a moment the other day, yeah, where something went a little wrong in a section that is like, the start of the click track and something went wrong. And so I had to stop it at a fairly inconvenient time. And the click track in this particular song has a, like a ramp, a tempo ramp that goes up in it. And so we would have need to get from the ballad tempo where we were safely to where all the, like the max isms that live in the track live, you know, and this click sort of ramps us accurately on a day by day basis. Stop the click and be, let the band play. And then to fire it back at the the new click and that we were there because yeah. we played we played 300, 400 shows together. Like, of course, it's there. And that that's like deeply satisfying in a musical way to be like, we are just a very tight, like well oiled machine. Um, so those are like very like proud and nerdy and like unsung victories. But those kind of like disasters and wins happen a hundred times in just one night you know like there's all sorts of like mini micro things that happen and i think part of the things is just kind of dealing with those fluctuations but there's a hundred ways to deal with a hiccup yeah brilliantly put and and so you mentioned um a while back dominic lugging a very heavy curse while back in the day <laughs> what, what what was the curse while you were lugging around so my first keyboard a, a beautiful gift from my parents once i was really serious about playing in any band was a, a pc 2x Oh, which wow. in in some ways is like the keyboard I'm most familiar with. And even though I haven't touched it in a while, but like when it's the only thing that you have, you learn it very deeply. Like my ability to get other weird sounds out of it or to do other things with that keyboard was a, a lot. Um, and such a like, yeah, learning to layer, learning to split, like learning all of these things all in one place, just because it's like, oh, I, I need to figure out everything. It's got a million sounds. Like, how do I do it all? And yeah, I mean, I think of all the places and staircases that that has been lugged up and down and, you know, bless my parents uh, for for indulging it. Uh, so yeah. it's like that and a big like roll in KC 300, KC 500, whatever, like big thing. And, you know, and then, you know, I, you know, I grew up more in the suburbs when you could like bring a car to a gig. So then it was the high school years is like, how many keyboards can I bring to this gig? Like, what, what are all the things that I could pack, ostensibly pack inside this minivan right now? Um, And so I got uh, uh, like a Korg Triton and then someone gave me a, like an old Yamaha kind of like almost like a selena ish kind of thing that has like the organ and the strings to it and it was that and then one of my like fondest memories was you know acquiring this old fender Rhodes from like a family oh, wow. friend where it's like hey this has been sitting here do you guys want it and we opened up and the answer was of course yes obviously um and we opened the lid of it and inside were leaves and cigarette butts <laughs> And it's like, oh boy. And so that was like my my pops and I, you know, like high school project was like taking out each thing, sanding them down and like rebuilding wow. this roads from the original parts. And so like I still I still have it here. And it's um yeah, so so acquiring and collecting keyboards. And then you then you move to New York and it's like I need one. I need one. And it should, I, what's the smallest thing that I could get away with? And then, you know, the, that was like early Nord electro territory. And so then hauling that to the, the, the far reaches of the five boroughs and yeah, just early gigging days being Nord on back 
and a cart with stand and amp. And then if I was very ambitious, I still had my Triton at that time. And so it's like Nord on back and then like Triton stand and amp just like bungee to 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 no end. And and then doing the up and down subway steps. Like I've developed a very oh, wow. weird knowledge of like where is every elevator in the New York subway system because I'll go there because this is too heavy for up the stairs. <laughs> Absolutely. But yeah, uh, so 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 many different keyboards and stuff in the journey um and it's kind of interesting what gigs are the like hey just sit and play piano and like coming from a jazz background sometimes it's just showing up and playing that and then sometimes it's like how how, how dorky can we get like how many keyboards can we be can we get in here i was fortunate enough to be on a session where uh i had played piano and i i, I had become pretty comfortable on the b3 and love love tracking tracking organ uh, and then I was like, okay, cool, we'll do synth overdubs. And someone brought out a Juno 60. And right away I was like, oh, this this is this is a thing. This is, again, we, we're now going this way. And so then collecting other sorts of synthesizers. It's like all the, the things that you pick up on the journey. Do- Dominic, what's the next 12 months hold for you? What's coming up? So it's a little chaotic. Uh, the, the next thing, uh, so I'm still at Anne Juliet, but I'm about to embark on a slightly new musical endeavor. I'm working with Alicia Keys on her new musical. Oh, wow. That's that's opening up the the public this fall called Hell's, Hell's Kitchen. And it's a wonderful project. I mean, obviously her and her music, that yeah. body of work is unreal. Um, and it's um, being supervised and orchestrated by Adam Blackstone, um, who is just the, the ultimate MD of MDs, you know, everything from whatever cool Grammy performance you enjoyed. And he, it's like, oh, th- there he is. And, uh, you know, the sup- last Super Bowls and, you know, a- a- an insane list. And um, also Tom Kitt, who's a long, illustrious Broadway career. And to be brought into a very different kind of musical family and a very different style of playing, very different catalog, very different everything, but also just someone that is a supremely all-encompassing musician and so we just began rehearsals a few weeks ago so right now is a sort of insane period wow. where i am rehearsing during the day and then running off to play the show at night so that life is a little bit insane but in the in in the best of ways but that is that is the next thing that that's happening i couldn't be more excited about it it's a, such a cool inspiring project and the the chance to be trusted with another someone's like body of work and its totality mm. like that is is very flattering and like just the best of challenges in the best of ways. Yeah, what a body of work. Um, no, that's very exciting. I can't wait to check that out. And um, Dominic, another common question is tagging a keyboard player. Um, so someone that you would love to see interviewed and find out more about their career. Um, you know, I feel like there's a couple couple answers i'd love to hear anything that rick wakeman has to say i want to know what yeah. it's to, to be in big boots and surrounded by 10 keyboards and uh you know do all do all that and like um yes is my father's favorite band and thus very like deeply ingrained in in the fibers of my being and so like yeah like prog rock keyboards and like being 360 with keyboards is still like a very like uh the equivalent of the want to drive a sports car for me is like it's it's i'd wrap that that would be the like midlife crisis um and uh but i think on a more modern side i'd love to you know um i love the pianist anomaly uh who is oh, yeah. both in the very credible in the jazz world but also like folds in synths very beautifully and is like so understated i would also love to like hear what chromio has to say about stuff i've listened to a number of their interviews but like someone that people that make such modern music but with old gear and are so committed to it so i feel like a little bit of a uh different different things along the spectrum but okay. those those are people that i love hearing Great more answers. about yeah yeah wonderful uh rick, rick whiteman would, would definitely be someone that we'd uh we'd, we'd love yeah, i assume both of you follow him on twitter his twitter account is worth joining twitter or x <laughs> in spite of that becoming such a cesspool of a social media sure sure site. um but yeah, sadly, he has a very terse message on his website that basically says, "Don't approach me for interviews, please." <laughs> so <laughs> so yeah, sadly, I mean, he may remain on the bucket list. All good. I mean, he, he's left it all out there on the keys. The you know, it's it's it's, it's 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 all out there. But uh, yeah, just a, a very formative influence in absolutely. so many ways. Oh, I, I think I think for most of us, yeah, abs- absolutely. <laughs> um, we all just want to wear the cape on stage. I think that's, that's right. That's what yeah, that's uh, that's that's in the rider. That's mandatory. 
hundred percent. Yeah, hundred percent. So, so another question we love to ask all our guests, and I all hate this question, but I'm going to ask you anyway, Dom. Sure. Your five, your five desert island discs, five uh, albums you could not live without. Sure. Well, I think the first thing that comes to mind, I think of records that I was given that started to send me in a certain direction. Uh, Herbie Hancock's Thrust was definitely one of them of like, whoa, like I thought jazz was one thing, which I also still like, you know, being presented with kind of blue and other things like amazing. Uh, but someone gave me someone older than me gave me Thrust. And that that was a very like world opener kind of thing. You're like hearing Selena Strings and Fender Rhodes and just like the coolest psychedelic but also deeply musical things that was very formative hearing ben folds whatever and ever amen was uh a very very pivotal record to hear someone i i feel like in high school years i loved playing in a band but it was like well how can you compete, compete with the guitars or like what you know how do you fit in in this world and that someone would be that like uh proudly piano led and also able to like hit that hard was very uh meaningful and assuring in a lot of ways i mean i would have to get probably like either yes songs or fragile or something would have to be on that yeah. list like hearing or like close to the edge like so something in that catalog would have to get thrown in like the first time you hear a song that's 25 minutes and like a circuitous prog rock anthem would would definitely be in there brad meldow art of the trio volume yeah. four would be there um because that was also like you know, early years exploring the greats and then hearing someone that's just like somewhere in between of like age of like, this isn't old, like this is someone that's doing it right now. And this is where they're pushing it. And like, you know, this song, you know, all the things you are, but you haven't heard it like this. Um, and like, what meter are they playing in? Like, why is it hard? Like, it's, yeah. And just sort of like wrapping your head around that, that definitely, and like to play all the things you are, and then also cover Radiohead in one sort of fell swoop. That was very, uh, eye opening, and then I guess uh, to t take that baton one notch further, I'd probably Radiohead, Amnesiac, or In Rainbows. It would be hard to pick, but that yeah. would that would that would be there as well. The idea of people taking the recording studio as an instrument very deeply to its full level, and like being meticulous to be both meticulous and like beautifully sloppy and intentional about that, and yeah, just. Uh, orchestral string section and a drum machine and this and like j that that also was very like mind opening so d i don't know d desert island but those were things that like changed my path I I incredibly and th th things to which i owe huge debt of which i'm sure i pilfered and stolen uh, anything that i could have anything that wasn't tied down <laughs> Yeah, fantastic, uh, influential, influential dish there, which we'll which we'll link to on the show notes as we always do. Uh, Dominic, we're coming to the end of our time together, sadly, but before we let you go, we have to inflict upon you our quick fire ten questions. Okay. So we'll ask 10, 10 real quick questions and just give us the first the first answer that pops into your head as we as we go along. Question number one: What's the first musical you ever heard? First Broadway show saw with my folks, I think, was the Scarlet Pimpernel. Oh wow! Yeah, there yeah, you go. yeah. <laughs> Old school, but good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, most important pre-show ritual: making sure the iPads charged with all my music, <laughs> making sure the page turner is charged, making sure the stuff is charged. Like the, the wh anything that's under the umbrella of is the stuff working today is that's that's the ritual. Do you prefer the big theaters or the smaller, more intimate venues? I, I guess smaller. Anything where you can look out and still see the faces is very. Yeah, very nice. I'm sure this doesn't apply in the musical theatre area, but just thinking of your other gigs, um, Dominic, transpose button or adjust on the fly? I mean, adjust on the fly. It's hard. I have perfect pitch, and so doing the transpose button is it breaks my brain. Um, to like play C and it be E flat is yeah. Um, the best advice I ever got in high school when my music theory teacher found out that I had perfect pitch, he was like. Don't tell anybody. Like when you get to college, don't tell anybody. Um, Cause like I would flunk ear training in a world where you just all of a sudden hit the transpose button. It just like absolutely melts my brain. Um, but yeah, and and I also would like to think part of the, the thing I went to school for was like, you learn this song, you learn it in all 12 keys. Someone should be able to just start singing and you go. So definitely no shade to the transpose button, but uh, I would have to say do it on the fly. 
Awesome. Thank you. What's the favorite gig you've ever done of any kind? I mentioned the gig with Kevin Mahogany. I guess <clears throat> that's very to show up to a place and not know any of the music and have it go well and to be that like in the moment, deeply deep. You have to be, you know, because there's gigs where you can come and go in terms of your focus or what, what it might mean to you. But to be so like, I am I am so fully here right now. I, I, I think about that gig a lot. So, I, yeah, th- I'll put that one down. Great. And so you are in one of the musical centres of the universe in New York, but is there another city or town you've played in that stands out to you as a highlight? I When we opened Julia, it was in Manchester, and there was something oh. about that town that, like, they really welcomed it in, in, in a very specific and, like, rowdy kind of way. And I have a lot of, like, specific sentimental... Uh, memory attached to like us opening the show out there and how like you know when you work on it for six years you don't do it in front of audiences for a long time and then all of a sudden there's a thousand people and it's like well i hope they laugh i hope they work i hope it works and so night one when it works and sorry to dive on a tangent but we we did um when we opened toronto this is sort of looping back to when things go wrong but it's related to your question um so in my in-ears is all the instruments and a mix of everything but there's a microphone for the crowd so that i can gauge when to move on when you know when to move on to the next song and to just sort of hear the audience as as the sort of like last instrument we finished the first song of the show which is larger than life we hit the big button larger than life boom and in my ears is silence absolute silence and this was our first time back post reopening from covid and it was like every fever dream that i'd ever had during covid all happening at the same time like oh my god they hate it i i i like all your like imposter syndrome fires at all the same time like oh my god like this i knew it i knew it um and then i popped my ears out and through the brick wall like we're below the stage like not in the pit below the stage i can hear the wave of applause for it i was like oh they just didn't turn it on today i gotta (laughs) remind them to turn on the crowd mic (laughs) but file that under both warm city or like nice cities nice gigs and absolute disasters that's great what a relief that sound must have been when it came through can you tell us an, an artist dominic that you've never worked with that you would love to work with oh my gosh um Joni Mitchell or Brian Wilson? Yeah, wow. <laughs> Two great picks. Um, favorite music documentary or movie or musical in your case, Dominic? Have you got a favorite? Uh, what is it? 20 Feet from Stardom? However many feet from Stardom? Yeah, I love. I, I yeah. just love that film so much. I, I, my great. whole life is about like a deep interest in like the people behind the people in whatever form, you know, whether it's the Wrecking Crew documentary, whatever, anything that's in that world, I, sign me up. And I think that that... Um, the the tentacles of those great uh, background singers permeate so deeply into st- like the fact that it could be uh, the Rolling Stones or the Lion King, like all in sort of one thing. That 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 was very moving. So I, I put that down. Yeah, for those of the, those that out there that haven't um, seen that, you need to. Yeah, the Rolling Stones stuff alone is worth the price of admission. Yeah. What's one thing you'd love to see invented that would make your musical life easier? Oh, man. Uh, I would love a very robust version of main stage that runs on an iPad so I could just foreseeably yes. turn up to a club date with, like, so little stuff. Um, and, you know, I've sent some emails and I may <laughs> I've had some conversation with some folks. And I, I don't know if it's happening anytime soon, but that would be that would mm. be amazing. Like... I, yeah, I put that on I, I, on a very like practical, quick list of that I could turn up to sort of any place with whatever sort of controller in big or small size and just pull out an iPad and go. Mm-hmm. Great one, couldn't agree more. And then the last one, Dominic, your favorite non musical activity hobby? What keeps you sane outside of music? Uh, bike, uh, bike riding, cycling. That's I bike to and from the theater at most days as much as I possibly can and. Being on a bike in New York City to me means like the ultimate independence. Um, no, no traffic, no delays, no subway, whatever. Like just to be, it's the ultimate decompression. Leaving a show just to like sort of be out and about in the world, and so that would that would be on the top of the list there. Oh, great, 
Dominique, we cannot thank you enough. As we said at the start, you've you've literally well, it sounds like you were you rehearsing today and playing the show tonight and joining us. So that's yeah. no mean feat. Mm. Um, cannot thank you enough, um, and we look forward to. I know I'm excited about Hell's Kitchen, let alone everything else, and we'll definitely keep in touch. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a treat to have this conversation. I've been looking forward to this for a while, and it could could not have been better. You 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 both are the best. This was wonderful. We mentioned inspiring at the start of the show, Paul, and um, I couldn't agree with you more. Just so great chatting to Dominic. Yeah, he he, from being a lovely guy, which I'm I'm sure comes across when you when you're listening to him or, or watching him. He, he as as I said at the outset, he just just loves what he does. He's, he's passionate about it, and I, I love his attitude too, David. Which is you know be prepared for life and be prepared to say yes to things and and. You know, grab opportunities when they come up. I, I just thought that was really. I, I, I felt quite inspired after talking yes. to Dominic. No, absolutely. And look, I, I'm I'm happy to log online and buy pre-order tickets for Alicia Keys' Health's Kitchen. I'm sure it won't be in Australia for a number of years, but that sounds great. Oh, that'll be mammoth. Can you imagine yeah. what that would be like? That would just be mammoth. Yeah. Yeah. So no, a huge thank you to Dominic for taking the time to come on the show. As I said, as you heard, he literally. Uh, rehearsed for that Hell's Kitchen and then played a full show and then hung around uh, very late at night to join us. So we hugely generous appreciate man. it. Very generous man, yeah. So, um, and again, uh, well, we've also got another band T-shirt to discuss and pay kudos we for. We have. So I have this uh, wonderful T-shirt sent to me uh, via our friend Tammy, who's about to get a shout-out in the, in the outro from, from Canada. This is Rockzilla, and this chap here is Bruce. And my uh, my son, who's 20, was looking at this and he said, Dad, that looks like Godzilla to me. And I said, mm -hmm. well, Bruce and Godzilla get, they get confused a lot. Uh, you know, they're, they're brothers and they well, often get mistaken for each other. I think, uh, yeah, I think perhaps um, Bruce is Godzilla's stunt double or body double. So let me tell you a little bit about Rockzilla. They're a three-piece rock band, bass, guitar, drums. They all do vocals. Al, Kevin, Stacey. Uh, and what do they do? They do they they, they go around uh, Edmonton in Canada singing just all the big bangers, all the party hits, and they do a really good job too. They're a real power trio, and I think good three piece bands can sound like a five piece. Absolutely. Six -piece. And these guys go check them out. They're on um, they're on uh, on YouTube and they've got a Facebook page. But they're, yeah, they're cool. They they do a really good job of doing a great sort of three piece interpretation to all those classic rock songs. And you know what's funny, David? I can't believe I'm saying this because I've done a few of these now. And this is the first time I've introduced an all-male band. How about that? Oh, so, there you go. Which you would think yeah. would be, yeah. Anyway, they're very cool, very cool. I finally, finally found a, a band with blokes in it. And can <laughs> I say, um, Canadian men must be bigger and burlier than me because look at the size of this shirt. It's like a bed sheet. But, uh, oh, it's, that know, super, it's all that mountain hiking they do. Those guys yeah, are and, and fit the, as. And the lumberjacking and the... <laughs> Yeah, all that stuff, I reckon. Big, big, burly Canadian blokes. But yes. uh, no. So that's Rockzilla. Check him out. Thanks for the shirt. Cool. Beautiful. No, thank you. Um, and so, uh, yeah, big, uh, we'd like to be, do a shout out, as you mentioned, to our gold and silver supporters. Um, starting off with Tammy Catcher from Tammy's Musical Stew. Thank you so much for your ongoing support. It's hugely appreciated. Uh, the musicplayer.com forums, we've been members for many years. It feels like generations now. Do check out the keyboard corner on musicplayer.com. Um, yeah, highly recommended. Uh, we've, uh, there's been a, a, an intense discussion over the last week on Lockie Dolly, Paul, which I think you might have jumped in on. And so um, the brilliant Lockie Dolly. So there's yeah. lots of interesting chat. Yeah, I, actually, I haven't jumped in on that. Um, I've, I've sort of been a bit busy. I haven't been on that, that forum for a while. But I'll have to get back in there and, and, and check it out because yeah, I reckon Lockie's fantastic. He is. No, absolutely. Well, apart from being Australian, which, of course, makes him fantastic. <laughs> That's right. But, but, you know, I, I wish I could play keyboards the way he can. Let's put it that way. Yes, that makes two of us. Um, mm. And also a shout out to Mike at Midnight Mastering, um, great mastering and mixing service for a, an extremely reasonable price. I do only promote what I believe in and I've used Mike's services repeatedly and I'm also actually part of a music project with Mike and his what he delivers each time just blows my mind. So highly recommended. And Brother Paul Brown from the Water Boys. Thank you, Brother Paul. They've just announced yet another. I, I don't think those guys ever stop. They've just announced, I think, a 30 date uh, European uh, UK tour um, after just doing a whole bunch of the US and other parts of Europe. I still want to get him down under. Hopefully, it'll happen soon. They're not afraid of hard work, those blokes, are they? No, they work their butts off, so which is yeah. great. Yeah. Um, 
So, and then most importantly, a huge thank you to all of you out there for listening and to you, Paul, for joining me as always. Couldn't do it without you, sir. Uh, again, thanks for having me as, as part of the uh, part of the show. And can I just, before we before you go into your final your final spiel, just to keep the, the show going a bit longer and make Joe Mascara have to uh, <laughs> listen to a few more things, I was just reflecting on what, what Dominic was saying about getting around New York and how you can, mm. can't have your 15 keyboards, it doesn't really work. You've got to very economically work out how you're going to get uh, you know, things strapped to your back, things in carts with all the, the various – I guess the transport's one thing, but then the load-in, I think, with a lot of New York venues oh, is another yeah. people playing in bands. But he's not the first guest to mention that, right? So I always feel like we need to do a uh, some kind of – whether we do a live stream or, or feature, just the, the New York musicians, the, the, ch- the unique challenges yeah, of being logistics. a New York musician – uh, I don't know. I think there's there's something in there. I don't know. Yeah, what do you reckon? No, I agree. I think London, New York, and I mean, I've had the huge privilege of going to New York three times, and I totally get what he's talking about, having not mm. liked gear in. But I find that some of the restaurants and other places you visit are hard enough not, not carrying music gear, let alone carrying music gear. Oh, so, yeah. and, and let alone the traffic and everything else he mentioned. So, um, I mean, yeah, it's yeah. it's quite rightly considered one of the greatest cities in the world. I love it to yeah. bits, but it's very challenging from that viewpoint. Could Agree more. Yeah, well, look, you know, and I've I've never been to New York, and I definitely want to go there at some point. But but in my hometown of Adelaide, if you go into the middle of the city in peak hour, you might see a car. So there you go. So, you know, I'm, I'm no stranger to challenges as well when it comes to traffic. <laughs> Oh, dear, that's funny. All right, thank you all out there for listening. We'll be back uh, soon. Um, And we're getting close to our 100th episode. And all I'll say to tease our 100th episode is either we're going to have one of the most amazing guests of all time, which is a huge bar given all of our amazing guests to date, or one of the crappest guests ever. So that's all I'll say at this stage. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But uh, I'm hoping it's the former and not the latter, and you'll understand the latter when it happens. (laughs) Are Are you going to interview me again? (laughs) so anyway yeah we look forward to we'll be back uh, in the next week or two and again thanks for listening and we'll talk soon